Okay, good morning uh, everyone. Um, it is very nice to see so many of you here. I would like to first of all really extend a very, very warm welcome uh, to Secretary General of WMO, Mr. Michel Jarot. We are very pleased to have you here at SCI. I also like to welcome, of course, all the people here at the seminar, all the friends that are looking at this through our webcast as well, uh, at SCI offices around the world and other guests. Uh, I also like to welcome David Molden here, the Director General of EasyMod, um, which is really great to have you here. Uh, we also have friends from Stockholm University, which is also very nice, and other colleagues from, from WMO. So it's great to have you all here. You are right now at the Stockholm Environment Institute headquarters mm -hmm. uh, and the Stockholm Center, which is the sort of main hub of mm -hmm. SCI. But we also have colleagues from quite a few other centers uh, around the world. SCI, just mm -hmm. very briefly, is an organization created in 1989, focusing on sustainable development. So an emphasis on environment and development, of course. Focusing on delivering science for policy and decision making. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, having a mandate which in some, some respects is very similar to that of, of mm -hmm. WMO. Of course, we are an organization that relies very much on the work you do in the organizations. We are very interested to hear. And vice versa. And vice versa. <laughs> and that's exactly what we, would, we, we are hoping to have that kind of discussion yeah. later on today. Uh, just to briefly say, the, the mandate of SCI is also very wide. Mm -hmm. uh, natural sciences is, of course, a very important aspect of this, but we also have very strong social sciences. Uh, so we have that whole spectrum of, of um, different disciplines represented here. Mm -hmm. We have research that is broadly divided in four themes. Uh, managing environmental systems, which I think is also very relevant for this topic. Uh, reducing climate risks, mm -hmm. so climate is of course key, but also yeah. atmospheric sciences is are very important there. Transforming governance, because we, need that, we believe that this is very important, and also rethinking development on the more long term. Okay. So this is what colleagues are working on in seven different continents, or seven different countries around the world. Um, so we are very interested to hear more about, of course, also what WMO is doing, and not least related to the global framework of climate services. So. A warm welcome. I'm going to hand over um, also to Magnus Bensi, who from now on will moderate today's seminar. We don't have microphones like this, or you, you know, it's just for the webcast, but we have to use these microphones. So if you're going to ask questions later on, wait for the microphone as well. So, Magnus, you will take over after the presentation, but I now leave the floor Thank to you, you, and please give Michelle a warm applaud. Thank you. No, thank you, thank you very much, Johan, and for this opportunity. I'm certainly delighted to be here. It, it's not the first time I'm coming to Sweden. My first time was uh, here now, 41 years ago. But um, uh, it's the first time I'm coming to this place. And uh, when, when you contacted us, I, I was very happy to say yes for many reasons to your invitation. But one of them is precisely for the reason that you described. When it comes to climate, it is not we're not dealing only with the traditional partnerships. We are dealing with new types of partnership, and I will come to that in a minute, which are very much multidisciplinary, which have to look at things from, uh, from different angles, which we are not used to treat uh, uh, together. So um, you suggested that maybe because many of you know a little bit about WMO, but you suggested maybe I can say a few things about WMO. So I decided to, to give you a little bit of, um, oops, now I have to, Treat that with uh, well um, to, to to give a little bit of historical perspective, but mostly linked with the climate uh, with the climate issues. And uh, when it comes to metrology, there's been a realization actually for uh, now more than uh, 200 uh, 250 years that no country can do it alone. We need to cooperate. It's obvious to say. I'm stating the obvious by saying that the, uh, the weather doesn't stop at the, at the borders. But in practice, it was so clear from the beginning that no country can do it alone. Therefore, cooperation was essential. And uh, the cooperation led in the middle of the 19th century to the establishment of the predecessor of, of WMO. And it is, we are not the oldest international organization. We are only the second oldest. That's very interesting. The oldest international organization is the ITU, the Telecom Union. 
And if you think about it, it was necessary for the telecom union to exist before we came to existence. Because what made the difference for internal cooperation metrology was the availability of telegraph, that you could exchange observation in real time. Of course, the definition of real time is, is a bit tighter now than it was at the time. But still, it allowed for the first time observation to be exchanged fast enough to be used for prediction. Not only compiling the logs of the ships uh, uh, when they came back to the harbour, but in, 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 really in real time. And from the beginning, the emphasis was on uh, protecting, uh, protecting life, protecting uh, property, in particular uh, ocean travel at the beginning. Not yet aviation, for obvious reasons. It was, uh, remember, 1873. So, but um, one, of the, one of the first tasks was, and it's still very much valid, is to encourage uh, observation standardized observation, exchange of observation, quality control, and, uh, and that is still valid. It's still one of the main function, one of the main mandate of the organization. No country, once again, can do it alone. Right now, we have this uh, hurricane hitting USA, Isaac. You cannot predict the hurricane over the Caribbean if you don't have the observation over Africa. They start their life as what we call in our jargon, easterly waves over Africa, and then they travel, they evolve, they interact with the ocean, and now we get a, a hurricane. So cooperation is essential and all the big countries need all the small countries and vice versa. It was an NGO actually, IMO. It was a, co it was a, 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 a collection of uh, directors of med services, uh, including Sweden, and, uh, and uh, they, they met to try to coordinate their thing. But after the Second World War, it became obvious that it was not sufficient. It needed to become an intergovernmental organization. Government needed to commit to this, uh, to this cooperation. And in 1951, we became a specialized UN agency. On the climate issue, we organized three major conferences. The first, the second, the third World Climate Conference. The first World Climate Conference, 1979, led to several things, but in particular to the launch of the World Climate Research Program. It uh, was launched only in 1988, it took about nine years, but still, that was the foundation for the World Climate Research Programme. It also led to the, uh, sorry, in 1980, it led to the establishment of the IPCC in 1988. And the second World Climate Conference was the decisive conference between, uh, before the Rio Plus Zero, uh, the original uh, 1992, the Earth, the Earth Summit. It also led to the creation of what we call now the Global Climate Observing System, which is... So you can see the first World Climate Conference concentrated on the science. Great. But to say we need more research, that was great. But the second World Climate Conference says, OK, by the way, to do science, we need more observation. Uh, we cannot do science if we don't, uh, if we don't uh, strengthen the, uh, uh, our, uh, our observations and our uh, data for that. But even that was not sufficient. Uh, that's why we had the third World Climate Conference. So yes, we have now more solid uh, observation. We have made huge progress on, the, on our scientific understanding. However, there's now a huge gap between the scientific information and what decision makers have available to make decisions. Um, so we need to bridge this gap and that was the main purpose of this third World Climate Conference. And we'll come back to that because this is the main theme of my presentation how to develop a framework to try to bridge this gap. What I should have mentioned, which is not there, is that in 1928, we created a commission for climatology. So it's not a new thing, this climate issue. So, but it took a bit of time, as you can see, to, um, to collect enough evidence to understand how things are, are, are working, and even more importantly, uh, to convince uh, decision makers. And there, as you know, we are still struggling a, a little bit. There's still here and there a few skeptics, and these a few skeptics are very vocal. And uh, anyway, so uh, maybe I'll use that one actually. Sweden, Sweden, lovely country, uh, but also a wonderful, uh, a very active country in our discipline. We have a, a prize. We don't have a, a Nobel Prize for metrology. We have the IMO Prize. It's not quite as prestigious, but still, this is the highest distinction in our discipline. And you can see that six uh, Swedish persons got uh, this prize. It was uh, awarded only after 1951. So you, 
it, there was nothing before, before the Second World War. And all these people have played a major key role in our discipline. Uh, Hosby has really been one of the contributors to transform metrology into what it is now, uh, dynamic metrology. Uh, all the research he did is still fundamental for numerical prediction, for climate uh, modeling. He left his name to the famous Hosby waves. So, it, really a, a, a key pillar of our discipline. And then you have a number, and I, could, I, I don't want to go into too many details because all of them left their names. Professor Bergeron, for example, is um, one of the, uh, many people don't realize that we are still struggling to understand our rainfall uh, forms. How you get out of this water vapor, you can get this condensation, what is the mechanism? And he, was, uh, he, he left his name to what we call the Bergeron process. And uh, I'm sorry, I pronounce his name in a French way. I'm sure you pronounce it differently, but uh, he's Swedish, definitely. <laughs> and um, and, and he, he, he made a major contribution to understand the formation of uh, raindrops and therefore rainfall, which is still very much used uh, uh, now. Uh, Professor Newberg was also playing, uh, I think he was one of the president of the WMO Council as well. Professor Bolin, uh, I'm sure many of you knew him personally, uh, one of the father of the, of the IPCC and, and many, many, many other things. And recently, Professor Bengtson, who uh, I happen to know very well because uh, he hijacked me twice from uh, France to go to ECMWF. Uh, he was my head of research when I was a young scientist at ECMWF, and then when he was the director of ECMWF, I was his deputy. And uh, so it was a particular pleasure for me, that was the last time I came to Stockholm, to give him the IMO uh, prize. So he's, and as I'm sure many of you know him, he's still very active in many, uh, in many respects. So Sweden has played really a key, a key has made a key contribution to our, to our discipline. Now, I, I'm not a great fanatic of mission and vision statement, but I felt it was useful to uh, summarize what are the key things. We have three key words, weather, water, climate. Weather, it's obvious, it is in the name, well, meteorological observation. Climate uh, is, for us, is very much seen as the looking at the weather over a longer period, over the evolution of the weather, the variability. Water, we are looking, water and you organize the World Water Week every, every year. So water, you know, is a complex issue. So the contribution of WMO in the water is on the hydrological side and more specifically the, what we call operational uh, hydrology. So that's, that's where our niche is in that. And we very much cooperate with all our partners on water, in particular under the umbrella of UN Water, which I was, uh, which uh, I'm uh, chairing for, for a while. So the, the mission of WMO is really to, um, strengthen to facilitate this uh, cooperation across all, uh, all countries. Um, to, and it, we're still struggling with that, to, to make sure that the observation network, but not only the observation themselves, uh, are, are, are covering our uniform of the planet, but they can be exchanged. So you need the infrastructure for telecoms, for treating this information, transform that into, into application. We still need these very essential standards. And you know, when you talk about climate, there are still some of these polemic are linked to the way uh, data are corrected because things, context is changing, urbanization, the instruments are changing. So we need to, to uh, this is still a very essential part of, uh, of our activities. And to, um, to um, definitely encourage more research and more training, more uh, capacity building. Unfortunately, not all countries are at the same level by far, and I'm sure this is not a surprise to, uh, to any of you. The priorities have been shifting over the years, and last year we had the Congress, which is our sort of uh, supreme body, where all the members of WMO meet every four years. By the way, we have now 189 members. Uh, essentially, it's universal membership. In Europe, just to give you a few examples, those countries who are not member of WMO are countries like um, San Marino, uh, like Vatican, but I guess they have a direct uh, line of communication, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, a few, and, and, and a few others like this. But essentially, it's universal uh, membership. 
What are the priorities now? And if you look at the bottom right picture, observation. We still need to put more effort on observation and exchange. It's, it, it's, it's a constant struggle. We improve things, satellites are bringing better, but still we need to come. Satellite information don't replace traditional observation. They complement each other. And uh, because of many reasons, in particular financial reasons, many countries are struggling to maintain their observation uh, network. Second priority, which is getting more and more critical, disaster prevention. Disasters are increasing. They are increasing in uh, frequency, but they are also increasing in terms of impact. There will be good news, I will come to that in a, in a minute. But disaster prevention is a major, uh, is a major um, uh, priority, and I was very, for me, it's one of the uh, uh, very important positive outcome of the Rio Plus 20 conference is that now disaster prevention has been recognized as a key element of sustainable development which it was absent from Johannesburg, it was absent from the Earth Summit. Now it is recognized that you cannot have sustainable development without disaster prevention. And uh, just look at what happens in Haiti, in a few other countries. Uh, I don't think anyone needs to be convinced of that, but it was not part of the international uh, agenda on the connection between development and disaster prevention. We need capacity building. Uh, it is, again, a constant struggle for that, but... Uh, but uh, the, for a long time, we wanted to, to um, close the gap, and, and the gap has increased between developing and developed countries. So we should not give up on that one. There's, uh, we are not allowed to give up. We need to do more in this, uh, in this area. Um, there is also uh, some other, uh, for, for a number of reasons, uh, priority on aviation, but I don't want to bother you with that. It's, it's because of the requirement that uh, services to aviation become ISO certified. So that is a technical priority, this one. And the, f the one on the top is the GFCS, and I will talk about that. It's how can we provide all the sectors which are climate sensitive, and that's essentially everything, with information which is suitable for making decisions. And I will come to, uh, to that. Now, I said disaster. There are bad news. That's the top right diagram. What you they see there is, uh, uh, is statistics from the CRED. You may know this database maintained by, um, it's a center for research on epidemiology of disaster based in, in Belgium. So they collect statistics on, on disaster. We are working with them, we cooperate with them. And over the last decade by decade, over the last 50 years, you see on the top the increase in the blue column. This is the increase in the cost in, say, billions of US dollars per decade of hydrometeorological disasters. So they've increased dramatically in, in cost, going from something like 10 billion per decade on average to now uh, probably over 500 billion dollars per decade. It's not only due to the change in the economy. It's not only due, uh, so, so it's a mixture of many things, change in the economy, more people living in vulnerable areas, change in demography, and also, uh, increase in the number of some of these uh, some of these events. By the way, the, I don't know how you would call this color, this uh, red brownish, uh, well, like the color you put on your wooden houses in, in, in Sweden. <laughs> so I don't know whether it has a name, this color. So these, uh, these uh, uh, other ones are the geological disaster. And you can see that they are still, when you have an earthquake, it's a spectacular thing. But on average, the cost is less than the hydrometeorological disasters. So this is the bad news. The good news is the bottom, and now I need to remove Rebecca Driver and Lisa and Busson, if I can. <laughs> no, 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 okay. Uh, can I remove? Uh, <laughs> because it's, a, uh, fine, thank you. <laughs> it's an important message. So the same graph with the same color code is for the number of people who die from these disasters. And you can see a, a dramatic reduction of the, blue, uh, of the blue column. So we are saving more and more lives. Uh, still, too many people are dying of the order of uh, over 200 uh, thousands per decade. But, but still, it's much less than it was 50 years ago. Why? Because of early warnings. Because now we are, for the hydrometeorological disasters on all time scales, ranging from tornado to drought, we can provide better and better early warning. And these early warnings are better and better integrated in, uh, in decision making. 
evacuation, protection. So we are saving life. And you see quite a different story for the uh, geological disaster, earthquake, volcanoes. Uh, actually, it, it would include tsunami, the other one, the, the brownish, the brownish colour. It's a different thing. Why? Because for most of these disasters, uh, there may be many reasons, but one of them is that it's not yet possible to give proper, uh, proper warnings. So this, uh, this figure, I, I think, is very, uh, very interesting. And we want, to, we want to do even better for the uh, hydrometeorological disaster with longer time scale, like drought, which we, 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 we think of, uh, of a climate time scale. And I will come to, to that in a, in a second. So Rio, Rio plus 20, I mentioned already briefly that I'm one of the person who came back from Rio um, with a pretty positive analysis. Of course, some people were disappointed, maybe because the expectation that uh, different people had from Rio were, were different. The higher your expectation, of course, probably the more disappointed you are. That was one of the challenges in Copenhagen. That is, the expectation was so high, probably unrealistically high. That, uh, But in Rio, there were many things which I feel are very encouraging. I mentioned the, the reference to disaster. That's very encouraging. Also, the decision, uh, the, the reference to water is actually stronger than it was in both Rio plus Zero and Johannesburg. There's still, there's a very explicit reference to um, uh, the need for, uh, of course, safe drinking water, for sanitation, but also to what do we do with waste water. Also, there's an explicit connection between water and human right. You, water, access to water is a fundamental human right. So all these are encouraging. There was also a decision, and we are working on that. Uh, it was uh, a major subject of our discussion in UN Water in Stockholm this, uh, uh, sorry, last week, uh, that we, um, we uh, are working on the development of sustainable development goals. And that's very important because the Millennium Development Goal were focusing mostly on eradication of of poverty and unrelated issue. The sustainability development goal will be relevant, should be relevant for everyone, and they will not be time bound. So it's something which concerns our planet, the global planet, and the future uh, generation. So this, in, in that respect, Rio Plus 20 has been a milestone conference. Some people say, yeah, but you didn't define these goals. It's a failure. No. It's good that we didn't define the goals, because if we had defined the goals in detail in a rush, we might have ended up with ill-defined goals and goals that we cannot measure. Some of you might have heard about the, the sort of polemica about the uh, access to safe drinking water. One of the million different goals was to say by 2015, half of the world, uh, we should reduce by half the number of people who don't have access to safe drinking water. Great. Who can be against that? Petit problem. How to measure it? So it was not possible to measure it, so what was decided was to measure it through a proxy indicator. What is this proxy indicator? The proxy indicator is to say we can measure the number of people who have access to what we call improved water access. In other words, if you get water from a tap, it's not the same as taking it from a pond which is shared with the, uh, with the animals, with these things. So this is improved uh, water access. The assumption was that improved water access was a good indicator of safe drinking water. Take Bangladesh. Bangladesh, many underground water uh, are, is contaminated by arsenic, by the way, in a natural way. If you get it through a tap or through a thing, it's still unsafe. So it is not good enough, but it was the best we could do. So it, w <laughs> it is important that we define goals in a proper way with ambitious, aspirational uh, goals, we can, but goals which are ambitious, but realistic, and also measurable in an objective <coughs> way. So I'm very happy that now, this is what we shall do over the next 12, uh, 18 months, ahead of the, uh, of the period going for beyond 2015. Climate, back to our, our favorite climate. Climate, of course, as we know, is complex. And climate is not only about, uh, ab uh, about looking only at the atmosphere or the ocean. You see, many things interact with each other, and they interact on different scales. The global scale interacts with the regional local scales, and the local scale actually influences the, the, the other scale. So it is, it is a complex issue. And one interesting point to illustrate that is the um, El Nino, the ENSO. For literally 
centuries, fishermen near Peru knew about El Nino because it affected the, the catchment of, of fish. So they knew there was an El Nino, which was very much an ocean uh, phenomena. Metrologists, our discipline is a bit more recent. We have known for quite some time about what we call the Southern Oscillation. If the pressure, atmospheric pressure in Darwin in Australia is lower than usual, it was higher than usual in Tahiti and vice versa. So that is CISO effect. We call it the Southern Oscillation. And it's only literally over the last about 30 years, maybe a little bit more than that, that we understood that the two were two facets of the same phenomena. So we don't have an El Nino, Southern Oscillation. We have uh, the El Nino is the ocean part, of the, and the southern oscillation is the atmospheric part, and the two interact with each other, and you cannot predict one without getting the other. And this understanding has led us to now uh, a position where we can indeed predict the onset, the evolution, and the decay of El Nino slash La Nina phenomena uh, several months or several seasons in advance. And it is not perfect by far, but it is much better than what people used to do before. You see, this is since the 1950s. You see some, I, I cannot call it periodicity, some fluctuation. And people struggle with statistical method to predict that. And of course, it didn't work because it's not really uh, periodic. And, uh, and uh, now, now we, uh, we come uh, to a situation where we can do much better than the traditional statistical method. And it is used already for major decision making in uh, several parts of the, of, of the world. So this is one of the, of the tremendously successful um, um, scientific progress over the last 30 years. And, but it is not fully translated into things which is used in decision, uh, in decision making. So that was just one example to, to illustrate. Um, now, you, you, you have all seen this, uh, the, this curve. This is from the IPCC report on the, on the left. Now, we are convinced there's, there's a near unanimous consensus that, um, well, sorry, a few things are factually. They cannot even be skeptics on that. The greenhouse gas concentration are increasing. We measure that. So I don't accept that anyone can dispute that. We measure it with great accuracy. We observe the temperature increase, and you have seen this polemic in particular around Copenhagen and later to say, well, maybe it's not true, maybe you are measuring the effect of urbanization, this data. No, sorry. Uh, 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 we know how we do, we do, we know how to analyze this data. But um, this temperature increase, the question is, can we attribute it to human activities or not? Or is it part of some, uh, uh, some natural um, uh, variability? And the last IPC, every IPC report from the first to the fourth went one step further in, in stressing uh, that indeed it was due to human activities. And the last one says it beyond doubt. Every report will go further because the evidence gets stronger and stronger. And it's true for a long time, the signal was difficult to extract from this variability, but now, uh, now we, are, uh, we are beyond that. And the challenge, of, of climate change, well, there are many challenges, but one of the challenge is that it makes, how to put it, in the past, many of the decisions on, uh, on if you built a dam or something, were based on statistics of the past. So you decided to dimension new things based on return period, like the Dutch uh, are very vulnerable to storm surge because of the low-lying things, so they decided, okay, let's protect against something which would happen every two, four, four, five hundred years. So you decide what is the, the, the level of protection you want, and fine, you can do it. If you have the technology and the money to do it, you can do it. The problem is that the past now is not sufficient. What used to happen maybe every hundred years might happen every 10 or 20 years. So it's quite a different context. So to make decision, the past is no longer a good indicator for the future. And it's, it's very tricky to come to decision, to make decision making not only based on statistics, but also based on scenarios, on context, on <laughs> it's, uh, it's the decision making, it's a different uh, way of, of, uh, of uh, doing it. So, how do we uh, identify the needs? Well, the needs, unfortunately, are not the same for the various sectors. And they're not the same even in one sector for the various levels of decision making. If you take agriculture, for example, 
the farmer will need some type of information, the hill farmer, but the person who is managing a dam which is used for irrigation needs a different type of information. So we need to, we need to really identify these various sectors which covers essentially all socioeconomic sectors and to try to find what do we need and uh, iterate what can we do for that. It's a big challenge and we feel that it is it would be unrealistic to try to address that all at once, that to say, okay, let's solve everything at once, this is not really uh, realistic. But definitely we need to, uh, we need to analyze that um, a bit more in detail. And clearly, right now, in most countries, we don't have enough uh, information available. So this is why, back to the Third World Climate Conference, we came to the conclusion that we need to establish a framework for providing these services in a way which can be used for decision making to the various sectors. This decision three years ago was taken unanimously. Now those of you who have participated in the COPs in various climate discussions, you know what, how difficult it is to get a unanimous decision. This was unanimous, no disagreement. So how do we do it? We put in place a high level task force which made proposal for the WMO Congress last year. And once again, Congress decided unanimously to develop that. Fine, all that is great. It, when I say unanimous, it didn't go without discussion. I can tell you, it was tough. It was, but still, at the end of the day, unanimous decision to, uh, to do it. And now we are in the process of translating that decision into concrete, uh, concrete action. So we immediately put in place a special team Felipe, he's somewhere, Felipe, he's uh, the head of that team. So if you want any more question, any more detail, uh, the, this is the man. This is the man and uh, he, he has a big task, is to prepare for an extraordinary session of our Congress in a, few, in a couple of months from now. When I say extraordinary, it's really extraordinary. It has never happened before. It's the first one in the whole history of WMO, which will be focused on the development of this global framework. What do we do? What is the governance? How do we implement these things? And the way, as I said, we cannot do everything at once, so let's try to find out what are the priorities we should tackle. Definitely, and I will concentrate only on some of these, uh, some of these boxes. To do, to do uh, the, the purpose of this framework should be operational. The, if you have a user, an operational user, he, he, has to be, he has to be able to trust that the information will come. You cannot have something which is done sometimes or not sometimes. It needs to be operational services. It will have to be done on several scales, global, regional, national scale. Even the biggest country in Europe, no country can do it alone. The countries are getting together through various mechanisms. In Western Europe, there are many mechanisms where they cooperate with each other. Uh, on satellite with UMETSAT, on modeling with ECMWF, and the UMETNET. There are many, many mechanisms. There are networks of universities. No country can do it, uh, can, can do it alone. So we are going to establish some global structure, some regional centers, and of course, there will be national structure. We want to put the priority on the most vulnerable. And the most vulnerable often are also the least developed uh, countries because the two, the two issues have definitely a connection. We identified, and I'm speaking, uh, Felipe, correct me if I'm wrong, we identified through a survey 70 countries which right now have either absolutely nothing or very little and certainly totally insufficient to provide even the basic services. It's a huge number. Out of 189, 70 countries have essentially nothing. And very few countries, even in Europe, can say it's satisfactory. I would, I would even argue no country uh, <laughs> has, uh, has enough right now. So partnership is essential because we are not talking only metrologists or oceanographers. We are talking, we are talking all, all kinds of communities, including communities which traditionally are not used to work with each other. Like, for example, when it comes to climate, demography is important. Normally, metrologists will not talk to, demograph, uh, to, to demographic experts. Economy is important. And, and I, could, I, could, uh, I could go on and on. So we need to establish new partnerships which are not deep-rooted in our uh, scientific uh, culture. Data exchange, we, I discussed with some of you before, before the presentation about the data exchange. It is a challenge. We have pretty good basis for metrological data exchange. It's significantly weaker in some other areas like hydrology. 
it is non-existent in some, uh, in some of the things which are, uh, which are to be covered by this global framework. So there are many, many challenges to be addressed. And for the sectors, instead of trying to do everything, let's concentrate initially, I uh, and insist on initially, because later we shall cover more, on four priorities. We identified these four priorities as water, uh, information for water management, food security, health, and disaster risk reduction. They are not parallel, uh, parallel issue because they interact with each other. Water is also there in food security, in health, in disaster risk reduction. And disaster reduction is also there in uh, water management and so on. These things uh, interact with each other. But we felt these were the four initial priorities. Why did we select those? We selected those because we wanted not to reinvent the wheel, but to map our priorities with those which were defined at the global level. Food security is one of the global uh, issues. Water management, this is why uh, this World Water Week in Stockholm is so important, is a top priority. Disaster prevention, you can see these priorities are top global priorities. So when we discuss with governments, we don't have to convince them that health is important. Don't. Take it for granted. How do we do it? How do we uh, get the, the link? So this is how we decided to set up these uh, four initial priorities. To practically to implement that, we define five pillars, or maybe, uh, yeah, l l let's say uh, four pillars and, and a foundation. The pillars, observation monitoring, we need to do more. It's not enough. Research, we need to do more. Second pillar, and these are really pillars. But we need to develop also an interface with the user, because this interface often doesn't exist. And how do we uh, af afterwards develop products which can be concretely used for decision making? And this is the user interface platform. This is new. This doesn't exist in most countries. And all that has to be on solid foundation. And the solid foundation is capacity building. So we need to do all these, all these issues. Observation, just to illustrate that there are many gaps, but you know that, you know that. Uh, research, no, I don't want to spend too much time on, on that because I'm so passionate about that that uh, uh, you would have to bear with me uh, for many hours. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about that because initially we tried to present it as a matrix, two-dimensional matrix, and clearly that's we didn't manage. It's more complex. Th it has many more dimensions. Uh, the minimum we managed to do with a three-dimensional matrix, and even that, I think, is a bit too uh, simplistic. But we have to take the uh, geographic scales into account. That's the top, global, regional, national, local, the, the time scales. And the global framework will concentrate on sc time scales ranging from seasons to decades. Season, like prediction of El Nino, to decades, uh, what do we do with the IPC scenario? How do we plan for the, for the future? And we shall have to deal with the various uh, aspects of, of, of this data management, analysis, monitoring, prediction, products, uh, delivery. So this is sort of to try to structure our, um, our action. The user interface, because I said this is something new, so this is something where we would like to, um, we, we, we have to, uh, to do a bit more even conceptual work on, on, on that one. Here you, you, you see the global, regional, national community, meaning local, local level, and, and uh, many, many, many aspects. Uh, we need to get feedback from the communities, and it's much more difficult than what you think. You have many conferences where we say, oh, we need to, to get the feedback from the health sector, and we invite a medical doctor. That's not... One medical doctor doesn't mean that we get the feedback from the health sector. One farmer doesn't mean that we get the feedback. So we need to organize that in a systematic fashion and the needs are different, different countries, different communities, different. So it is an incredibly complex issue and uh, we are now discussing with our partners, first of all for the health, we want to make full use of the networks of the World Health Organization. It's a priority, we would like WHO to lead that. Food security, we want FAO and the World Food Programme and a few others to lead that. Disaster reduction, we have a structure in the UN system, ISDR, we want that to play a role. And water, well, we have UN water, so let's not reinvent the, the wheel. Let's make use of the existing uh, mechanism. But there are many things. You see, beyond the dialogue, we need also a lot of advocacy, outreach. Um, so many, 
uh, it, it is a, a challenging task. Let me give you just a few examples of what we mean by climate services. And it's based on things we had which are being done now in an ad hoc way. But it's just to illustrate what, what can be done. Africa is probably the continent where we have made the, the best progress on, on uh, structuring that. We organize for various sub-regions in Africa what we call Regional Climate Outlook Forum. What is it? We get the experts from a sub-region, in this case uh, it's the Horn of Africa, and these experts get together and uh, they elaborate ahead of the next rainy season consensus prediction of what is the likely, uh, for example here, uh, rainfall. Is it going to be above normal? What is the probability? You have three categories in each box. Uh, if you take the light blue, for example, it says that there is 40% probability that it will be above normal, 35% uh, probability that it's near normal, and 25% that's below normal. It's a real example, this one. So it's not a theoretical one, it's, it, it happened. And this is done in a consensus way and they, get, uh, they have access to all the information from all the major centers of the planet, all the experts are coming and for many of these forums we have also the key representative of the key user, uh, user group. But you can see how difficult it is to use this information. It's useful but it's limited and it's, uh, it's challenging. You see 40%, 35%, 25%, not easy to make a, a, a final decision with that. So how is that translated? Um, and on the, let's stay for a while on the Horn of Africa. On the top right, this is information which should be fed to organizations such as, the, in this case, the World Food Program. And you know the World Food Program is, uh, is having a, a, a quite a challenging role in uh, w when there was this drought in the Horn of Africa because it's not just a matter of bringing food after you realize it's... Uh, it's, it's widespread, it's, it's anticipating, prepositioning, uh, getting, and it's not always easy even to, uh, you, you see where Somalia is and the piracy in the thing, to bring the food is by boat is a challenge, to bring it by plane is a challenge, to bring it by land is even more of a challenge. So there are lots of logistic issues, and now they do use this information practically uh, for their activities, and they're very, very happy. And that's an international organization, but also at the national level, the uh, government are using that more and more and Felipe could talk a lot more about it. For example, in Ethiopia there's a very interesting scheme uh, which has been developed with the, uh, the government authorities together I think with the World Bank and with uh, the World Food Programme as well, which is, you can think of it as a sort of insurance thing. Let's not wait for the drought to strike but let's anticipate, let's have this kind of a financial instrument so that if some indicators are exceeded and the referee is the Ethiopian Meteorological Authority on uh, precipitation, humidity, blah, 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 temperature, automatically it gives access to some resources. And that means that it allows a much, much more effective uh, response. It has been so successful that it's being replicated in uh, Malawi, uh, maybe Mali as well, or is it anticipated? It's a different thing, but in Malawi. So th they are th this information is now translated not only in traditional response, but also in linkage, linking with uh, some functional instruments. Another example is on meningitis. You know, uh, you see th what is called the meningitis belt. In, uh, and, and meningitis happens to be uh, more um, prevalent when it's dry, when you get these dust particles. And because of this in forecast, you can anticipate that. First of all, for meningitis, one of the challenges is that you have vaccination, but the vaccination, first of all, is expensive and it's, it's limited, its effect is limited. So if you do it too late, it's too late. If you do it too early, it may be a wasted investment. So to optimize these activities, I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, so bear with me that uh, what I say could be misleading, but what the message I'm trying to get is that you can optimize this action by linking it, and it's done right now. There are similar things uh, done for malaria as well. Uh, so we can use this information provided it's organized in a proper way. So it's... Uh, now, how do we, how do we uh, see the next steps? Uh, definitely, we want to... To, to define the framework, because you cannot have cooperation based just on ad hoc bilateral agreement. It has to be a global agreement. You need to structure that. If you want to be effective, not to waste investment, you need to have a, a structure. You need to define national mandates. Who will be responsible for that at the national level? Some, it should not be just a, a collection of goodwill. Goodwill is essential, but I'm sorry, it's not sufficient. It has to be organized. 
you need to strengthen capabilities in the, all the key uh, areas I've, uh, I've mentioned. We need to find a way that these various communities, climate, agriculture, food security, just to take an example, uh, they, they, can, uh, they can talk more to each other. Health and, and climate. Some of um, I'm coming from a country uh, which was badly affected by the uh, severe heat wave in 2003. The World Health Organization estimates that in Western Europe in 2003, between, difficult to know, but between, let's say, 50 and 80,000 people died out of the heat wave. Think about it. It is a major natural disaster. Uh, 50 to, to, to 80,000 people dying from a disaster. What went wrong? Well, actually, it's, it's fascinating. The health system was good. The meteorological warning were good. And still, in France alone, 35,000 deaths out of that. So something went wrong. What went wrong was the connection between the two, the two disciplines which were not enough connected. Of course, lessons are learned. But you know human nature, often lessons are learned only after uh, a disaster. But what we want is to make sure that we don't have to wait for even worse disasters so that lessons will be learned. So it's not only a problem for developing country. I took on purpose an example in a, in a developed country to show it is uh, all countries will benefit from, uh, from that. So, in order to, to test, we are not very maybe innovative, but it's a very effective way. We want to have a few pilot projects. And we selected the pilot projects so that they, 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 they correspond to, first of all, the four initial priorities, but also country with special things. And uh, Felipe, in the question, uh, could tell you more about the pilot project. I think there is one in Chad uh, and Niger. OK. Okay. So we are trying to find a number of pilot projects. So that's, uh, that is what we shall do, and uh, that's it. So this is my conclusion, that many issues are interrelated to, to each other, that we cannot look at sustainable development without uh, looking at this other aspect, climate change, disaster prevention. And uh, now we want to map our action using the framework of the development of the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. But to do that, we need to really uh, put more efforts on capacity building, on multidisciplinary uh, partnership. Capacity building, to come back to that, I'm not the only one to say that. I know it's, uh, uh, I'm almost stating the obvious, but unfortunately the obvious is not sufficient to, to attract resources. It should be seen as an investment, not as an expenditure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the framework is really a, a key opportunity to, to do that. So final thing, and I hope I will not uh, uh, get uh, lawyers upset by misusing the logo, so I try to combine <laughs> the WMO logo with, <laughs> with something. Thank you very much, Tusen Tak. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle, for a, uh, a fascinating presentation with, with lots of content, lots of content that's very relevant to the work that we do at SEI, where we also try and translate science into policy and, and support decision making. Um, because that was nice and, and long, the presentation will go straight to some presentations yes. from SEI staff. And first of all, um, Richard Klein, who leads our reducing climate risk theme. Good, good morning, and, and um, thank you very much, uh, Michelle and, and, and other WMO colleagues for joining us here at, at SCI, and, and thank you for a very inspiring and fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I, I don't want to undermine the importance of your message at all, but I would like to add something to that, um, and, and that is you've emphasized the, the importance of, of climate data, climate information for decision making, but I would submit that climate data and climate information are necessary but not sufficient to provide climate services. Um, why do I say that? Based on, on some of the work that we've done here at SCI, and I'll, I'll give a few examples, um, we, we found that the model by which people tend to think about climate services is one that's very linear. It is, the assumption is that as long as you've got the right information at the right place, action will happen. Decisions are being made. And what we found in, in research on adaptation, on research in, in other fields in environmental studies, that you know, this is social science, that 
it's a very complex process, even if the information is available, even if the information is presented to presumably the right kind of people. Decisions are often very complex, they aren't made, or there is a series of trade-offs with things that have nothing to do with, with climate change to start with. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a program that uh, SEI is, is working on together with the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute and several other uh, partners uh, funded by the uh, Swedish Foundation for Strategic Environmental Research, uh, SWISHA, which stands for Swedish Climate Impact and Adaptation. Um, the role of, of SEI in that work has been to uh, investigate factors that influence people's decisions to act or not to act uh, in the face of climate risks. And, and it's been in-depth research with stakeholders first here in the Stockholm region and now there's a, an in-depth case study in the forestry sector in Sweden where, where we found that people first of all have very different perceptions of risk but also respond quite differently when presented with climate information. Climate information that comes from um, the climatologists, the climate modelers uh, here, here in, in Sweden. Um, what we found is that they operate obviously on, on different timescales, that the information might be at a level of precision or detail that they find very difficult to relate to their day-to-day -day activities and that you know, their, their day job is one in which they have to juggle many different responsibilities and, and climate is, is one of them. So in order to put climate services that they were basically presented with, you know, the climate information that they were being presented with to good use requires an additional step. Um, a second example um, is the uh, recent uh, IPCC report on special uh, on, 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 on extremes, uh, ESREX, um, which uh, a colleague of mine, Lisa Shipper, and, and myself were lead authors of, and that report has a, has a strong section on climate extremes, on, on, on projections of, of climate extremes under different scenarios, but the majority of the chapters are actually dealing with how does one actually address those disasters, how does one use the kind of information? And you already mentioned the 2003 uh, heat wave in, in France. An interesting example, or an interesting comparison, was that in that same year there was also a big heat wave in, in India. Um, whereas the people in, in France, and you said all the information was available, the people there who were most affected and most vulnerable were those that, uh, the elderly who, who lived alone and who were even more isolated because uh, family might have been on holiday and, and weren't able to respond in a way uh, they, they could have responded. The people who were most affected in India were uh, landless laborers who had no choice but to work on the land of others until they literally dropped dead. You know, so the vulnerability is very different to a similar meteorological event. And, and that also suggests that the kind of information you need to respond effectively to reduce people's vulnerability goes beyond just the climate information. You know, this is about issues of, of development, equity, rights and, and, and so on. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, a similar example. Um, the disaster that took place in, in New Orleans wasn't primarily due to the strength of the hurricane or even the failing of the levees. It was an issue of social inequality within the city that affected one particular group uh, in particular. Um, the third and, and, and final example of, of work that we're doing within SCI is, is linked to the uh, Global Programme of Research on Vulnerability Impacts and Adaptation, PROVIA, which some of you might be uh, familiar with, which has been set up as a um, counterpart to the World Climate Research Programme that you've already mentioned. Um, if you think of, of climate science or climate research in, in IPCC terms, World Climate Research Programme focuses very much on the physics and, 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 and the hard science of climate change of the IPCC working group, one kind of research. And, and we felt that there was something missing uh, that represents the working group two uh, kind of research on vulnerability, impacts and adaptation. Uh, so UNEP about three years ago took the initiative also in collaboration with WMO and UNESCO to set up a counterpart of WCRP to encourage coordination and dissemination of research globally on vulnerability, impacts and adaptation. And, I'm part of the scientific steering committee of that and one of the issues that we found is that you know, to reduce vulnerability effectively and to support adaptation, one needs to go beyond identifying the issue. In other words, to go beyond providing the climate data and climate information. Uh, that is of course essential, but what we say, not, not sufficient. Um, one of the activities that we're involved with is the revision of guidance to be used by countries, developed and developing, or also sectors, um, to assess their 
vulnerability impact and, and adaptation. The current guidance that exists was provided by the IPCC back in the 1990s, which very much took a, a linear approach. You know, these are the climate models, these are the climate uh, scenarios, and this leads to an understanding of what could be your climate impacts. And once you know what your impacts are, then you'll automatically adapt to that. Well, we know from, from a lot of research that that's not how it works, that even if the information is available, there needs to be that additional step, also beyond capacity building, but that's part of it, uh, to, to ensure that climate services are indeed being put to, to good use. Um, in, in fact, uh, some researchers, uh, Maria Lemos in, in Brazil, wrote an interesting article recently that suggested that the availability of climate services or climate information, climate data, can actually increase inequality. In, in, in Brazil, she gave an example where um, in, in, in agriculture, the commercial farmers in, in northeastern Brazil were able to benefit from the climate information that was made available, but the smaller holder farmers, the non-commercial ones, actually were at a loss. They were outcompeted, and um, you know, this is one of the aspects uh, that, that needs to be taken into account. Now, in your presentation, you, you emphasized the need for, for partnership uh, within the global framework of climate services, and, and I would argue that you know, Provia is very much ready, and, and with Provia, SEI is very much ready to, to step in and, and ensure that climate data, climate information is complemented with social science and other information that, um, that ensures that climate services are being put to good use to those who, who need it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And, and what we'll do, we're going to take one more presentation from, from SEI, and then Michelle will give you a chance to respond, if you like, to these presentations, and then open up for questions from the floor, or even from um, anyone joining from the webcast from, from overseas. But we're very lucky to have Maria Escobar, who's from our US Center, um, another benefit of having this talk during World Water Week. Mm -hmm. So, Maria. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I have this. Do I have to turn it on, or it's... Uh Okay, so thanks for the opportunity to present the work that our team is doing. Um, I work at the um, California office of SEI. Uh, I am a hydrologist, a civil engineer, and environmental engineer. And um, I've been working for five years with SEI um, with some projects in California, but uh, most of our work right now is in Latin America, of my work. So, um, I'm going to present a few case studies to, to um, show how some tools that we are using uh, require climate information and the way in which we are using them as well. So um, I'm going to talk about WIP, which is the tool that um, we develop and work with. Uh, it's the Water Evaluation and Planning System. Um, I'm going to describe some of those projects that we are developing and how we use meteorological data for uh, those analyses. So this is a teamwork and uh, David Perkey, Jack Siever, who develops uh, and mm, do, does all the WIP programming is here. Then there's Laura Forney also that does um, agroeconomic analysis and Vishal Mehta who uh, is doing some of the more urban related work. So, um, this tool, um, here are the numbers of users of WIP in the different countries in Latin America. Um, so there's a user base that uh, are already um, using this software for doing wire analysis in their countries. Uh, we don't know exactly what all of them are doing, but we develop some of our projects through those networks. And um, many times they contact us and tell us what they need and what are the type of projects they want to do. So um, that's what we are working on with this user base. Um, this is the interface of WIP. This is a model of uh, La Paz, El Alto in Bolivia. Uh, all the watersheds that provide the water to the cities, which are the uh, red dots in the model, and the rivers that go to the Titicaca Lake. So we are trying to represent this system. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about that project and I also uh, have a more detailed description of the projects here if you want to uh, pass that around. Um, the different um, elements that we model then are here on this upper screen, you know, the rivers, the canals, the reservoirs, the demand sites, 
and the catchments, which are climate-driven uh, rainfall runoff um, elements. So all of these areas are the supply areas. It also includes glaciers, of course, because there are Andean glaciers here, and then how the water moves uh, through canals, then goes to the cities, and all the availability of water, whether or not is enough for uh, the demands. There are also some agricultural demands up here that we are also trying to represent. So that's what we do with this tool, trying to represent the watersheds and the supply and demand interactions and the management of the infrastructure. So um, the different projects that are in the handout, um, we have um, some analysis of special ecosystems like glaciers and paramos and ecosystem services as well. Um, uh, we try to provide information to do some water benefit sharing analysis as well. Um, in Bolivia, that's the project that I was talking about. I'm going to talk more. Now, it's um, technical support to, the, uh, to create a um, decision tool so they to, to make decisions about the uh, future infrastructure so uh, they can keep up with the growth of the demand. And um, this is tied to um, the climate investment funds and PPCR uh, programs. So the idea is to be able to um, produce information and create scenarios that, um, uh, so this infrastructure that are built in the future can really integrate uh, climate into, um, into its um, planning. Then we have the, um, a Quito vulnerability study that's being done with uh, Lisa Shipper. It also incorporates climate risk. It's, also, it's not only on the vulnerability of water, but <coughs> other sectors as well. And in Colombia, we have the, um, um, several projects right now being funded by USAID. And the focus of this is to create uh, and build capacity also for climate um, planning. So some common uh, point, points of all these different projects, and uh, this is the city of Pereira in Colombia, this is the watershed, um, a watershed in Peru, in Piura, where there are many users, and, um, including agricultural uses, and this is the city of La Paz. Um, you can see how there are some urban and rural dynamics going on in all the different projects. There's also the conservation versus use of the resources interactions. So either the conservation of these ecosystems that provide the services that um, um, control and regulate the water in the watershed. And finally, um, the climate impacts on provision of the hydrologic ecosystem services. So how um, the climate is affecting the provision of these ecosystem services like glaciers and paramo. So the way in which you use all, those, all this information for these different projects is in WIP, in these elements that are the catchments which represent areas of rainfall runoff. Um, we, there's some data associated to each of those elements. And we create databases where we um, input that information and manage that information so it can be put into the models. So um, the data that we use, the meteorological data needs, and that we, what we have discovered through these projects is that um, we need historical precipitation, temperature, relative humidity, wind speeds, DMs, land cover type, and stream flow as input data for the hydrologic models. Um, we need the development of data processing procedures that are validated by meteorological organizations to reduce the uncertainty and increase the confidence and observed data. So it's very common that uh, the different um, meteorological organizations, they have observations, they have collected the data uh, for a number of years, but many times they don't even trust their data or the processes, the way in which they process data. So we have discovered that it's important that uh, there are some procedures that are mm, validated. Um, there's also the need for filling the gaps and comparing uh, observe data with global data sets because uh, it's, it's common to find gaps in the data. So um, it will be very important also to be able to fill in those gaps with um, 
global data sets. Um, we also need future climate scenarios that are validated with observations and at scales that are useful for specific analysis. Um, a notion of uncertainty associated with the scenarios so that this can be factored into planning and decision making. So um, since the data not necessarily are um, validated, then we need to have uh, a good understanding of that uncertainty for the historic but also for the future climate. And um, we need tools for processing the data to fit the models at different temporal and spatial scales because as you were pointing out, there are different global, regional and local scales at which these analysis are happening. So we need to know um, better. So um, the idea is that I think there are many connections with what you were saying and I think we can we can also help making those connections with the local uh, people that are really using these for uh, planning under climate uncertainty. And that's all I had to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. Now, I, I wonder, Michelle, whether we could invite you back up uh, to the front to take questions, and so those watching in can see you, and whether you want to reflect on either of the presentations, and um, first of all. Maybe just very quickly on the, on, on, on the last one, because indeed what was raised about the quality of the data is indeed a, a, a serious issue not always easy. We have standard, we have procedures to do that. However, um, e even for the quality control, it is not always, it has not always been done in a consistent fashion. Um, Sometimes even the metadata which would be required to do that are not always uh, uh, available, but they are standards actually. The and when you talk about meteorological organization, I assume you're talking about the various national med services, yeah. Yeah, so they, they follow normally the, the WMO guidelines, but there's something as I would like to add to what you say because it's even more challenging. In many countries, including in Latin America, there's a number of very precious records which are in paper form, which are not yet that digitized. Uh, Sometimes we don't have the proper metadata, we don't know, for example, temperature uh, with which instruments they were made, or wind measurement, we don't know always exactly the location, the height, the context, but still it is valuable information. And we are, we are um, promoting this uh, data uh, rescue and data recovery because much of this data is, uh, well, it's not always stored in good conditions. So the paper in many countries <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, very important to protect these data. So, but we'd be very happy to to liaise with you on that. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Before we go to the um, floor for questions, I thought I might just ask one general question. Um, and in your presentation, which had uh, a lot of content, Richard also asked about the partnerships. Now, delivering climate services is is a, an extension of the WMO's role. We look at the history from hard science to, to supporting users. And specifically in the research community, what opportunities are there for SEI and other research partners to engage with WMO within the framework? Yeah, uh, the, the partnership indeed, I and I can confirm you mentioned Provia. We are very much in contact with, uh, of course, UNEP. And, and uh, essentially you can consider that all the key United Nations system partners in this domain are part of it. But, uh, uh, and, and uh, if you look at the various pillars, the Provia would fit more into the data, uh, the user interface platform and user, and that's what you mentioned. When it comes to research, uh, there are again many actors, but I think we have to look at the research not only, not only in the traditional WCRP, w, uh, World Climate Research Program, because as you mentioned, the research is not only about the physical thing, it's also research into the application, it's research into also um, how to make decisions in a context of uncertainty. Uh, it's research from m in, in economy, in health, in uh, so it's, it's multi-faceted uh, research. And we are going to leverage on the research activities of the various partners in the UN, but beyond that, for example, a key partner has uh, been ICSU, the International Council for 
uh, for science. We still use the old acronym ICSU, and, uh, and 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 this has been this has been bringing us a very interesting thing because they are multidisciplinary. They cover not only the sort of physical research activities, but they go into the economics, they go into the uh, human, uh, the social science, the human dimension. So that is also uh, something that we are uh, going to elaborate. So back to your specific question, how the SEI could, could contribute. We are building this, uh, this research pillar. They are consultation. And at this stage, when we define the process, maybe Felipe, you could say more. I would like Felipe to answer in more detail because they are consultation. We very much welcome your uh, your feedback. But I don't know. I, I think it maybe Felipe could add on this question. Thank you, Michelle. Felipe, uh, we'll use the microphone for the uh, webcast. I'd, I'd like to start by um, kind of reacting to some of the comments in terms of uh, the additional need of having more than just um, the climate information. Um, I come from a, a part in the world where I came across that particular uh, thing. Um, in 1997, we went, I went to speak to a particular um, community leader because we were introducing a color-coded warning system. And uh, I say, well, now you have uh, the benefit of, you'll see the, the flags being raised when a tropical cyclone is coming. And his reaction also it was, um, well, I would not um, 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 consider what you are trying to, to tell me or to, to give me. And I said, but we have the best science. We could tell you um, that a tropical cyclone is going to come your way within 48 hours and you have enough time to, to evacuate. And he says, well, son, I'm 70, 80 years old. If I'm to die, I'd rather die by a tropical cyclone. And I said, but I still don't understand what you mean. He said, well, what I mean is, um, if you tell me to evacuate and I evacuate, I'll die anyway. He said, but how would you die anyway? Because you've already evacuated. He said, no, by the time I come back, my assets would have all gone and I'm too old to start all, uh, a life all over again. So there was a, a very special need. Uh, his assets were, in a sense, uh, more valuable to his life. He was uh, saying, well, you can give me a good warning, but I will not evacuate because um, there's a, a social problem which I would not ensure that uh, when I come back, I have to go back to my life. And I think from that, there's a very g good and successful case, which is the Bangladesh case. In Bangladesh, they've learned throughout the years that by building um, cyclone shelters was not enough because people would still not evacuate. So what they did was they built um, cyclone shelters and uh, the bottom floor or the bottom uh, part of the shelter is for animals. So that when people can evacuate, they bring along their animals. And because animals were one of the reasons why they never evacuated, they wouldn't leave them behind. So I think that there are good le lessons to learn. And um, the point to add is that the fact that um, that is probably quite uh, complicated because of the specific nature of uh, in local uh, nature of uh, uh, the way people uh, um, go into or react to, to warnings. So um, I'd like to now make a, a bit of publicity about something we are, we are doing and, uh, and I think that, that knowledge on how do you integrate other elements in, uh, in addition to climate service should come through what we are trying to establish now through the user interface platform which is one of the main uh, and uh, the innovative uh, uh, components of the Global Framework for Climate Service. Uh, we are going to have a, a conference in October 26 to 27 uh, uh, of October, which will focus exactly on the user interface platform. How can these platforms be established and how they should facilitate uh, um, understanding specific needs and uh, basically orienting um, not only research but also observations and other needs that uh, uh, would help uh, responding to those um, specific uh, needs. So I would want to um, invite you all to, to, to attend. We could send you specific um, information on that so you could also share the type of findings you, you have from your, your research. Now, going back uh, to the question of how we are developing these uh, 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 implementation plan, the Global Framework for Climate Services, um, the way we, we devised to develop the, the implementation plan was to make it a, a very bottom-up um, 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 initiative in the sense that um, the framework would have to be developed 
to respond to specific needs. And one of the first uh, uh, activities we did was to conduct uh, consultations, consultation meetings under the main pillars of the framework, which are those five uh, um, to which um, the Secretary General uh, talked, mm -hmm. but also under the priority areas, which are the four priority areas. And those provided the basic element that would have to be taken into account in developing the, 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 the framework, but also helped in identifying uh, as, uh, experts who could contribute to the uh, uh, process of the development of the implementation plan itself. We've just uh, uh, ended uh, on the 19th of this month the last round of uh, 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 review. Um, hopefully some, some of you might have contributed to the review process. Uh, 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 and after that, we're going to have uh, the document finalized. In fact, it's Friday this week we, when we have to finalize the, the document and, and then submit to the extraordinary Congress that's going to be held in, 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 in October. So in a sense, there was a bit of uh, oh, we're trying to engage as many people as possible. Uh, those who have not had the opportunity to, 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 to contribute to the review process, we would invite them to also come at the, to the extraordinary Congress and eventually um, uh, share their, their, their own perspectives um, as part of the whole initiative. Thank you, Philippe. We'll now take some questions from the floor. Yeah, I'm David Perkey. I manage the water group within the U.S. Center of SEI, where we develop the WEEP software, which Jack Sieber has been programming, and I work with Marisa on the activities in Latin America as well. Um, you had a point in your slide which was, we can't always assume that the historical climate patterns will be good points of reference for the future. Um, I don't know about in health and other sectors, but in water, that's like a fundamental pillar of the way water planning has been done. And so a lot of our research is really getting at this question of how do you make decisions about water management, about infrastructure investment, about environmental flows in the face of deep uncertainty. And we're nesting our WEEP software within some very innovative decision support frameworks, such as robust decision making developed by the RAND Corporation. Um, and a question that always comes up when you're talking with water planners about this new paradigm about decision making under uncertainty is they're still always wanting to have this sort of probabilistic assessment of what, okay, we know that it's uncertain, but try to tell us what the most likely outcome is. And in, in my work and in our research, and I think being influenced by RAND's robust decision making approach is that we really can't provide that information. Really what we need to look at is sort of solutions that are robust across the whole spectrum of possible outcomes. Do you have an opinion about whether we should be talking to our end user community about the probability of future climate conditions or now and, and perhaps in the future or is this idea of looking for solutions that are robust across the full spectrum really the wise way to proceed? Thank you. Uh, actually, this is one area where there's a, a significant amount of research which is being initiated now. There was not much research on exactly what you, uh, what you described, but, but there is some research which is emerging, and I would like to encourage more, because it's not always possible to answer your questions. When you talk about the water sector, indeed it, it is an interesting sector for this application because the time scales are somewhat different than they are in several other sectors. Indeed it is one thing where you invest in infrastructure, it is uh, the time scale considered are often of the order of decades which is not always the case in, a, in, a, in other sectors. You have many other sectors where the, the time horizon is of the order of years, sometimes months, and uh, sometimes even, even less than, uh, than that. So water is particularly interesting. Th there are a few sectors. It's not the only sector, but it's one of the sectors where the people are already used to probabilities, to uncertainty. So in a sense, we don't start from scratch. There is a, a lot of expertise. Indeed, what people would like is to have the most probable and and the reason why they would like that, they would like to use this information in a way similar to one they are used, deterministic thing. I want to have one. Tell me what is the most likely and then I will be... Well, it's not that simple because, uh, as you know, you need to have in this... Ev even if you have one scenario, you need to have this... If we simplify this typical thing, what is the cause of action, of not action, what happens if I do it and it doesn't happen, etc. You, you have this and you have to, to, to um, weigh that with the probability of each thing to happen or not to happen. Uh, 
But when it comes to longer time scale, it's even more complicated because it's not sometimes the average or the most likely scenario may not be the most important one because it could be that the least likely scenario, even if it's only 10%, could have a, a, huge, uh, a huge consequence. Or it could be that there are bifurcation, that you have two or three things. So it, it, it's really a different way to make, uh, to make decisions for, uh, for some of these uh, big decision makers. It's a lot easier for, when I say big decision makers, talk about water, for example, dealing between water and energy. If I'm uh, uh, the manager of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of a dam, th there are many applications you can, you can use the water in the dam for. One application is to produce electricity. One application is for flood, uh, flood management. Another application might be for irrigation and, and, and many other. Let's concentrate on these three applications first. And I'm going, bear with me, that I'm going to exag exaggerate for the sake of the, of the argument. If I'm an electricity producer, what I want is as much water as possible. The more water, the more electricity, the more revenue. If I'm a, a flood manager, and again, I'm, I'm exaggerating, I want as little water as possible, because if the flood is coming, I can absorb more, more uh, water. So if I'm a, a farmer, uh, 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 irrigation, I don't really care whether there's a lot or not enough water, but I know that if I don't irrigate now or in the next two days, my crop will, uh, will die. So these three uh, sectors often, at the national level, come under different decision-making authority. You might have a minister in charge of energy. You probably have a minister in charge of uh, agriculture. Uh, s you, you, may, you are probably going to have a structure on disaster prevention. And very few countries as a way, in this case, to make a higher level decision where you have to arbitrate at a pretty high level because you know if you, don't if you lower the level of the, of the water, you know exactly how much money you are going to lose in terms of lost revenue. You may not know whether the flood, it will be only a probability of a flood coming. So it's a tough decision. You, uh, or, and if you don't do that, and again, Felipe has been living in Mozambique, uh, uh, quite dramatic uh, experience of that, where his country was affected by decision taken upstream, <laughs> uh, beyond the control of Mozambique. And <laughs> so it is, it is not only even a national coordination which is required in some cases, it is uh, sub-regional or even international cooperation. So back to your question, I think we need to really th look at, that's why I cannot have a simple answer, but it's a, it's a very important question you, ask, you, you are asking, and we have to look as part of that how we can encourage country to, to, to use this, and it's easier to make this high-level decision, then the individual farmer will have to make the decision you want. He wants to know what is the most likely. Unless, back to the Ethiopian example, there is a sort of protection which is at a higher scale, which can spread the, uh, uh, spread the risk so that the individual farmer doesn't, doesn't have to bear the whole risk of his individual decision, but it can, be, it can be shared. But it's a different way for all these disciplines to interact with each other. I, I don't know whether I gave... <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Vishal Mehta. I'm also with the US Center of SEI. Um, I've been working on urban systems in India in the last couple of years, among other things, and building online platforms for communication access, I mean, a easy access to information on demography and water supply, and also building online uh, tools where people can build their own scenarios for the future of the city and see what might happen in terms of water supply into the future. Uh, one of the problems with urban centers in places like India is that uh, the data on, on how people use water and where it's coming from uh, is very scarce because pipe water supply is uh, only like less than half of what people use. So people have hundreds of thousands of wells and so on. So what I'm exploring and I'm coming to the question uh, through this roundabout way is public participation in collecting this data and building a knowledge base on urban systems. Is the WMO thinking about that idea as well? The use of public participation and public collection of data? I 
uh, actually it it goes much beyond WMO because in WMO the uh, data which come under the authority or um, coordinating umbrella of WMO are probably amongst the easiest to coordinate. When you come to atmosphere, in most countries, this is under the authority of government authorities. Every country has a national med service of some sort. And there are a few others on pollution, on things which may not fall under that. But actually, it's pretty easy. It's a lot more complicated when you come to uh, water data. And water not being only hydrology, wa water data in general. Actually, some of you might have, because as part of the World Water Week, there was a very interesting uh, seminar yesterday organized under the umbrella of UN Water to address this kind of uh, this kind of issue, and uh, and d definitely uh, for many of these data, we need to have also uh, we, we we need to have different types of uh, partnership, and there's also the question which is extremely difficult to solve is about the ownership, the sharing of this, uh, of this data, which is, uh, because often the data are taken in a particular context and uh, they can be either uh, commercial consideration, but they can be also um, uh, nationalistic or, or, or safety or security consideration. There can be many, many consideration. It is an uh, incredibly challenging uh, area. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, James Gao from China Clean Water Alliances. Thank you for the both speakers. I have three points uh, to mention about the keywords. One, you mentioned this uh, disaster risk reduction, which is quite important. I have fresh case in China. Actually, uh, at the, in the mid of July, I was in Kumamoto, is a Japanese, one of the safest old city. But then the chaotic situation happens, the raining flood, then several people died. So I go back to China, to Beijing. Uh, the very evening, there's a rainstorm, but something happened is uh, in the city, in the second ring road, city center, someone drive, driving a Jeep and drowned. It could never happen in before, but it happened. But uh, on the other road, it's uh, uh, also in Beijing, 170 cars drowned on the autobahn, on the highway. It, it should, could never happen. So it has something to do with climate changes, but also has something to do with uh, uh, whatever, corruption, whatever, doesn't matter. But What's relevant to our point is uh, how do we anticipate these kind of things? Because in cities, that's a heat island effect, and that's uh, uh, corruption for the under sewage system, which is uh, a lower quality, and for someone has a f um, uh, some um, dilute project be occupied the land, have been misused, whatever could happen. But I think that is issue now. I mean, for China now, I think SEI and uh, quite a few other organizations already shift that focus to other countries. China is big, so they have bigger problem. This is number one. Number two, uh, like you mentioned, dam. Dam still, it is issue. I still remember when uh, Clean Water Alliances announced its uh, establishment, then uh, quite a few UN people in China in their, on their uh, personal basis, refuse to participate if three gorgeous people participating and sponsoring the ceremony, <laughs> because they are against it. Because still it's debatable now. Uh, personally, I visit some of the upstream of three gorgeous, where because there's no dynamic of the water when you have big pool, so this, they already lost the self-cleaning function. And then quite a few algae and quite a few pollution happening. And also there's a garbage, there's a sand, many, many problems. So, so how to, to weigh 
the balance. And China, now I'm also in the Sino-Myanmar Association. Still, for the environmental project, we are not doing Myanmar for international society because of sanction. But Myanmar should be next on the list. China has problem with the Misung Dam. Because it's the first time in Myanmar's his, uh, history, probably everyone is against it. Everyone, <laughs> the left, the right, the official, and the people. So um, we should really how to carefully weigh and balancing the issue. This, the, sec the, the last one, the last one is about this um, water and uh, food security. Uh, today, one of my colleagues is addressing the issue that's uh, how to use sewage water, uh, irrigate the vegetable <laughs> agriculture, and what's the impact of that. And the impact is obvious. So. Okay, thank you. Maybe we'll take a couple more questions just to, to, to wrap up, and then we can get your reflections One while we're over here. Um, Michelle, you mentioned a couple of times the concept of index-based, weather index-based insurance. Um, and that's come up quite a lot in relation to particularly poor farmers because as a mechanism, it, it's it, um, the insurance company, for, if you're not familiar with it, the insurance company doesn't pay out on the actual loss of the farmer. They just pay out if, the, if certain parameters go above or below a threshold. So it's a much cheaper system to administer for the for the company and therefore the premiums are much cheaper. So it's a it's a product designed for low income farmers. But the insurance companies have always argued that the, the main barrier to such a, a product is the availability of local really local scale climate data because it, it even at the you know at the valley level. So I'm interested in, in Philippe, you also mentioned uh, several examples where it's it's been up and running now. What what the what the main barriers are to getting meteorological data at that local scale is it simply a cost, or is there some is is there his some sort of historical legacy that also prevents um, down that sort of really local scale meteorological data? We'll go take the microphone this way, and we'll go to the other one. Do do I answer now? What do you yeah. say? Uh, there's a okay. So f first of all, uh, you asked four questions, and I will not answer the second one because I don't feel quite competent to answer it. I would like to cover briefly the three aspects of your question. The first aspect had to do with something which is not unique to China, which is uh, in many of the big towns, and we are back to the point you were raising about the is the infrastructure of the town dimension in a way which can cope with the current and future evolution of the climate and in many cases the answer is no because either in many countries there was no planning let's face it in many t t if you go to two places like manila the evacuation system was not based on planning it was it developed in an uh, in its own way and and but even if there was planning the planning was based on past data and the the frequency of extreme events and in particular what is critical in this particular case you mentioned is floods and rainfall heavy rainfall has not been uh, taken into account so it's important to take into account this for the for the future the second thing you mentioned was uh, Myanmar and Myanmar I, I want to mention something interesting, and it's not a direct answer to your question, but it, it, it's an opportunity for me to mention something. You know they were hit by this, uh, uh, s uh, the, this cyclone with the associated uh, storm surge, which killed many people. And I don't want to comment on what was the political regime in Myanmar, because, but what I want to say is that for Myanmar, it was an incredibly exceptional situation. We couldn't find in our record any situation where a tropical cyclone would have this, well, maybe in this action they need to do it the other way around, <laughs> which, which normally they would, they would curve, and this one went straight uh, west to east and hit a place where we there was no precedent of such a cyclone to hit that, that place. Now, Myanmar is a bit like... Uh, Philippe was mentioning Bangladesh. It's a bit like Bangladesh. Uh, you have a delta. This part of, of Myanmar, at least, there was a delta. People are living in the branches. And uh, the warnings, by the way, were good. 
The warnings were, 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 were good. The, the plane company got the warning. They could protect the planes, the people, etc. The problem is the people living in this delta. They got the warning. But what do you do with the warning? Evacuate. Okay, thank you. There's no bridge. To evacuate, you need to evacuate with a, with a boat. But you don't take the boat if you're in the middle. So uh, the, the, the challenges were daunting. In Bangladesh, there are shelters. In Myanmar, there was no shelter. Can we blame them or not for not having shelters if it's it has never happened in this place. There are many challenges. So if you invest, you still need to decide what is the risk you want to cover. So I think it was Myanmar is a very interesting example. And we should take the sort of emotion out of whether we like or not like the political regime. That's, that's a different issue. But practically, it's a very interesting challenge how to cope with these things which, which were completely out of the, of, the Gaussian <laughs> of the Gaussian curve. So that. Uh, I wanted to answer the fourth part of your question, but now it just escapes me. Uh, what was the fourth question you asked? It's uh oh no, that was the second question. Uh, the okay, uh, maybe maybe it will uh, it it will come back. Ah yes, thank you. That's that's right. The, the, the sewage water. This is where I feel encouraged also by the Rio Plus Twenty conference, because if you look at Rio Plus Zero and Johannesburg, the emphasis for water was on two things: access to safe drinking water and sanitation, and uh, there was no reference to waste water. And now this is now identified as part of the Rio Plus Twenty. I don't have no one is the answer to what is the best approach to that, but it's a problem that is to be uh, that is to be uh, addressed. Then, yeah, you you you, you were asking the, the but to some extent it was a it it it, it was a common to 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 some extent. Yeah, the the to for this uh, for this weather uh, for this weather linked instruments, indeed, they need to have to have enough data. Now, one of the limitation, and that was the case in Ethiopia, the historical data are not enough to cover uh, to to get this local scale. So, as part of that. This is an I it is seen now as an investment, including by the insurance companies, that it is in their own interest to support that there should be better data. So definitely, it's another incentive to strengthen this data network. For the past, you cannot replace those data which are not there. But you can, to some extent, have some proxy information. It's not as good. And the way which is being done, the best way which is being done, is to reconstruct some of the past data through sophisticated data assimilation. It doesn't have the same local scale. But still, for, for example, many countries in Europe, in USA, uh, are working on what we call reanalysis. Actually, e Europe and USA are probably the most advanced in these things, where you go back to all the data and you go through very sophisticated uh, techniques how to uh, to reconstruct. And uh, and these instruments are very very uh, powerful to the point that actually, <laughs> in a sense, it's a beauty of, of 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 the way the atmosphere works, because the information one point tend to to influence, you can you can think of it of going backwards. That is, if you s if you know uh, the atmospheric situation, you can sort of work backwards and recreate some observation. And by merging that sophisticated way, uh, let me c give you some example. We think now we could reconstruct, maybe not not uh, perfect by far, not even very good, but good global maps of the weather, maybe going back before we had many observation, 200 years. Why? take a ship log and you make a surface observation now the system is so sophisticated that this information in a way which is consistent with the uh, basic law of physics can affect what happens in the upper atmosphere so we can get a feeling out of a few scattered information we can get a feeling about the, the global thing it's fascinating the the research which is taking place there it will not be perfect but that will give us some indication of some of these uh, fluctuation fascinating research it's <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we've got time for one more question. There's one at the back. Well, if this one's quick, we'll see if we have time for the next one. I'll ask question quickly. I don't know how quick the response is, but maybe it's quick. Um, I'm interested in, in the climate prediction part of your story, and presumably there's a lot of modelling 
involved in that. Now the IPCC is doing a lot of modelling, but that's more you know assessing what's there. Um, the area of work which I'm working on, the, the short-lived climate forces, there are you know lots of questions over say the the South, South Asian monsoon, um, rainfall patterns, the interaction between climate change and then local pollution particles sulfate, uh, you know, all of those things together. And I was just interested to know um, to what extent WMO is, is trying to sort of develop and coordinate research or whether that's under another forum. Actually, uh, I will give you the short answer and I would be happy uh, to give you a longer answer, but that would be really too long. The answer is this is coordinated mostly under the umbrella of the World Climate Research Program. There are a number of modeling uh, centers in the planet. When it comes from the sort of short meteorological time scale to the long climate scale, the, the impact on the modeling is twofold. One is because of the longer scales, the resolution of the model is getting coarser and coarser. So that's a sort of negative aspect. But at the same time, the complexity of the model has to be more and more. You don't need an ocean model to predict the, the next 20 minutes. But definitely you need an ocean model on monthly to seasonal to uh, multi-decadal time scales. And you, you, need to, you need to integrate uh, more and more elements. Now, all these models are, um, have their own uh, strength and weaknesses. And what is being realized is that to capture the uncertainty, one of the most powerful technique now is what is called multi-ensemble because of the different techniques. So there is, under this umbrella of the World Climate Research Program, uh, there is a lot of effort on, on this multi-ensemble. In other words, to get, uh, y y y you know, the, the, the way we try to capture the uncertainty is to run not only one, 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 uh, to have one run of the model, but to have maybe 100 run of the model with slightly different initial condition, uh, physical package, blah, 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 to, to modify that. And then you get a spread. You get, and you try to derive from this spread probabilities. But what is even more powerful is to do that with different centers, different models. This is why we call it multi-ensemble model. And this is coordinated under WCRP. But it's not only WMO is playing a key, a key role, but it's very much in co also with uh, UNESCO, in particular the Intergovernmental Osogonary Commission UNESCO and ICSU. These are the three key partners of, uh, of, of, of that uh, program. But more and more, we need now to include even some other dimensions, which were not covered in um, in uh, the original WCRP. For example, IPCC, you are right, IPCC doesn't do research, doesn't do modeling, does the assessment. So in order for IPCC to do its job, we need to have something to assess. So this is where <laughs> we encourage this, uh, this, this thing. But we need to integrate through the scenario, for example, even the economic perspective, the demographic perspective, the, uh, the other perspective. Michelle, thank you very much indeed for coming to visit SEI. It's been a, a fascinating conversation. Um, there's a lot of interaction two ways, I think, with SEI. As Marisa outlined, we are a user of, of information from WMO, but hopefully also a provider of insights from our research on, on how climate services can be used to support decisions. Um, for those of you heading to World Water Week, there is a bus leaving from SEI at 11 o'clock. Uh, the fun bus will be leaving at 11 o'clock. Um, but the last thing is just to thank you again, Michelle, a round of applause.